But some of you Florida people could have brought some warmer weather home with you. I'm just saying. I want to welcome you all to worship, especially if you're visiting with us today. We're so glad that you're here. And for those of you online, welcome as well. Make sure if you have any joys or prayer concerns that you put those in the comments, and we'll be sure to lift those up. There are pew pads along the aisles here. If you would please make time to sign those and pass them along. The announcements for today are on the back of your bulletin. I do want to call your attention to the fact that it is noisy can today. So um, if you've got any loose change, hopefully you can dig it out. Also, um, prayer shawl will meet on Tuesday at 1030 in the hearth room. The ecumenical Lenten prayer service is at St. Aidan's this week with the potato bar starting at 5 p.m. We also have some new ways to give. Some of our younger members have been asking and asking for easier ways to give online. Um, in the announcements, there's a text to give phone number. If you need it, we'll make sure to communicate it in a, all different manners. We're just getting it up and running this week, and there were a few bugs in the software, so we finally got it working. And also next week, we'll have a QR code in our bulletins that you just scan with your phone, and it takes you right to the giving site. So thanks to our younger members who've been urging us to do these things. Mm, family Promise is coming up. Kate stopped me and said that she has the sign-up sheet the week is April 3rd. I noticed there are quite a few families in Family Promise right now. I think they're full. So please see Kate if you can help with that week. Did I miss any announcements? Oh, I do have one more. I need someone who likes to play with their phone during church. If you like to play with your phone during church, please see me after service. I need some help at least going through the Easter season with um, making sure that what our online worshipers are communicating to us gets to me so that I'm not having to think about it because a lot of visitors come in and they see me playing with my phone and then I'm not playing solitaire. Um, I am actually communicating with our online worshipers and so in order to take that off my plate, I would like some help, even someone from home, if you're willing to text me and let me know. We begin our worship today with our gathering song, number 577. Please stand if you are able and let's sing.
Good morning. Good morning. We are called to worship. Scripture is full of questions. Where are you? Am I my brother's keeper? Whom shall I send? Who do you say that I am? Who sinned? How many times shall I forgive? If God is for us, who can be against us? Scripture is full of questions. So just like those in our scriptures, may we bring our full curiosity and wonder into this space. Let us ask and seek after our merciful God. Will you pray with me? God of good news, there is reading your word, there is hearing your word, and there is tunneling ourselves into your word, harvesting your word, building a home in your word, laying your word over us like a blanket, wrapping ourselves in your word. the children to come forward. The Gospel reading today is from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned so that he was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, neither he or his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went away and washed, and when he returned, he could see.
The second reading today is again from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, 8 through 41, and you get two. I so. <laughs> the man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is, and others said, No, it's someone who looks like him. But the man said, Yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He answered, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and said, go to the pool of Siloam and washed. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, uh, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. And others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he is a prophet. The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been born blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. And the Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying that he was born blind? How can he now see? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, Ask, he is old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind, and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you, and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he's from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard they had expelled the man born blind. Finding him, Jesus said, do you believe in the human one? He answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, you have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. Then he worshiped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, Surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Thank you, Mary Beth. So in our Seeking Honest Questions for a Deeper Faith series, we're asking this week, who sinned? We're in the Gospel of John, and in the scripture lesson that we just heard, John takes the story of healing and transforms it into a narrative for discussing the human condition 
and divine salvation. And as I thought about this this week, isn't this what we talk about every week? Our humanness and God's grace and mercy? Because in a world that seems dark, I think we need to be reminded every week that there is a light. Now there is a debate over to the extent to which John's gospel was actually shaped and determined by the conflicts between the Jesus followers and the leaders of the Jewish faith, or the Pharisees. And this text reports one of the most heated exchanges between those confessing Jesus and those following the Pharisees. Jesus is traveling with his disciples, and they come upon a man who was blind from birth. And seeing him, the disciples kind of try to test Jesus, and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, let's stop right there and take note of the human factor. This man is more than just a theological case study. He's a human being with feelings and hopes and dreams, and because he was born blind, his hearing is probably very acute, as is true of most blind people. So most likely, this man heard them talking about him. And most people assumed in those days that any serious health problem or disability was a punishment from God. And blaming the victim was all too common. This man had grown up with the entire world around him telling him that he was cursed. And so they're thinking, thinking that Jesus is going to say, since he was born blind, it must be because his ancestors sinned. Because in their thinking, someone would have had to have sinned in order for this man to be born blind. But Jesus doesn't provide the typical response. And the one that the blind man is expecting to hear isn't what he says either. And so surprisingly, Jesus says, neither. This man or his parents sinned. And that's a break from what they expected in the tradition. And then Jesus does something really unexpected. This is the ew factor. He spits on the ground. He makes somebody paste, and then he spreads it on the man's eyes, tells him to go wash, and then Jesus exits the scene. And obviously the man does as he's instructed. What's he got to lose? And just as quickly as he's healed, the paparazzi of the time swoop in, and it's all under intense scrutiny. The Pharisees are all up in arms. And the story continues in John for a bit without Jesus, even as a main character. The second half of the story is the longest stretch in this entire gospel where Jesus isn't even at the center stage. John tracks Jesus' story very closely, but the action shifts in this part. It follows the blind man and what happens to him. Wouldn't you expect that this miraculous news would just set off general rejoicing in the land? Mm, quite the opposite. One of the feature of most human communities, and sometimes not a positive one, is that we don't adapt well to change. And in that community, there is a well-established protocol or pecking order, and Jesus has just turned it on its head, anchoring the bottom of that pecking order for all of his life has been the blind man who was blind from birth. And if you wanted someone to spit on, he was probably your man. But suddenly, Jesus' miracle has changed all that, and those at the top of the religious order, the Pharisees, are not too happy about it. And no one in this entire story ever asks the blind man how he's feeling. He can suddenly see again for the first time ever. And all they want to know is who, how, what, where, and when. So they haul the man and his parents in for questioning because they just can't understand it, and they're feeling threatened. And finally, after they question the blind man, they question his parents, they go back to the blind man, he gets a little snarky. And he says, I already told you that. Why are you asking me again? Do you want to become Jesus' disciples? And you can hardly blame him. I think he's clearly had enough of this. The greatest thing in his life just happened. And these people are more concerned with a handful of mud than a pair of blind eyes that can now see. If this man were not from God, he said, he could do nothing. Whereupon they expel him and blame him as the sinner. Now Jesus comes back into the scene at this point because he's also condemned for healing on the Sabbath. 
and he had heard what the leaders did to the blind man, so he seeks him out. And then the transformation happens. Not just the physical eyes that can see, but the new spiritual eyes that he gets from his encounter with Jesus. Remember, he's never seen Jesus before. He only recognizes him from his voice. And when he does, he falls down and worships him. I believe, he says. And what about us? What sort of new eyes do we need? Now, I'm not talking about new bifocals or cataract surgery. We're talking about our outlook on life, the ways in which we see with the eyes of our soul. When we look at the people around us, those that we encounter every day, do we see them as they've always been? Do we see them flawed? Do we see them less than? Or do we see them as God sees them? Human children with infinite possibilities and potential. This is how Fred Rogers saw everyone. And today we celebrate Fred Rogers and all that he did in his ministry to help us see with new eyes. When we look at people different from us, people who come from another ethnic heritage or another religion or a different sort of community, do we assume certain things about them based on old prejudices? Or do we approach each encounter open to what God would be ready to show us? And when we look at the physical world around us, do we see it only as a scientist or an engineer is taught to see it, a place governed by physical laws alone? Or do we see it as a place where God rules, a place where miracles happen sometimes? Do we hear in birdsong a hymn of praise? And do we look at the sunset as a benediction on our day? When we call Jesus Christ to mind, do we only see him as a historical figure, a wise teacher, an ethical example, or a superstar who had a lot of fans in his day? Or do we see him as the risen Lord, who walks beside us, who speaks to us of love and compassion, and who guides us in the way that we should go? He can be all of those things, and he can be our Lord and Savior. He wants to be those things because Jesus loves us. He seeks us out as he sought the formerly blind man. And he asks us if we too believe in the Son of Man. And if we know that the one who is speaking to us is he, may it be so. Amen. Our song of response today is found in the Worship and song, which is the Thin Green Hymnal, it is number 3104. Please stand if you are able and join in Amazing Grace, My Chains Are On.
God does indeed give us amazing grace. So I want to remind you that we're paying more attention to privacy. And so for prayer time today, please, if you're going to lift up a prayer concern, give me the first name and then tell me what kind of prayer it is. If you want to give me more detail after the service, that is fine. But um, just know that we're being broadcast. And even if you're speaking, sometimes they can hear you. So just I want to remind you that we're trying to pay more attention to that. So um, I do want to ask for prayer concerns this morning. Does anyone have anything to share? Yes. Okay. The A team and the B team helped in the kitchen, and so we're grateful for them. And everyone that came to the salad supper, it was a huge hit. We served more than, we totally, 140 at least. 140 at least. Okay. Okay, so the first half of Pat's PET scan is clear, waiting on results for the second half. I do want to lift up, continue to lift up. Kathy Huber's brother-in-law, Mike, with a medical issue as well. And a note that Grace's friend, Alexis, or Lex, passed away on Thursday after a long battle with cancer. And if you were here for a game night or two, I think she was with us for at least one of those game nights. So we did get a chance to meet her. So prayers for that family. I see a couple of hands over here. Cindy, and then I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> Continue prayers for baby Diana. Okay, thank you. And then, oh, there she is. Sophia, what, what you got? <gasps> Sophia's joy is that it is finally spring tomorrow. We share with you in that joy. <laughs> thank you for lifting that up. Marty. For Linda's family. Oh, okay. Okay. Continued prayers for John Constantine and for Sandy. Okay. Wait, Karen? Prayers for a friend who passed away. Prayers for a friend. Yes, prayers for, the fam for a friend's family who's traveling in Israel for a wedding. Myra. I have a great joy. I have a ninth great grandson was born. Nine pounds, four ounces. His name is Mason. Mason, your ninth grandchild was born and he was nine. Great grandchild, I'm sorry, great grandchild. Awesome. Congratulations. Yes. Prayers for a family member dealing with mental health, yes. I always have two bulletins and how sometimes they both migrate back there. Our prayer list is in the bulletin as well. We continue to pray for Barb. Yes, I'm sorry, someone else? Oh, I am. Oh, Laura, I am so sorry. What's up? <gasps> Which uncle? Uncle Nate's birthday, We've seen, and Nick, and Tim's. Oh my goodness, you had three uncle birthdays all week. Was it fun? Awesome, thank you. And then Malia. Prayers for Ken. Congratulations and welcome, Diane. Yes. Claire's birthday is in three days. Happy early birthday. 
Did I catch everyone? In the bulletin, we continue to pray for Barb and John and Linda and Sharon. And Sharon did send in that she was like prayers that an assisted living facility that is a good fit for me may be found soon. Um, prayers for Judy and for Pat and Elizabeth and Stan and John and June and Richard and Tom dealing with some health issues as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray for our neighbors down the street and around the world who need food and water and clothing and shelter. We pray for our neighbors who are in distress, whose bodies and minds need your peaceful and loving presence. And God, we pray for our neighbors whose lives have been upended by disaster and who are in desperate need of provision and care. And we pray for our siblings who make up the Christian family across the world, that we would be your witnesses and workers for the flourishing of all creation. And gracious God, we pray that your goodness and mercy would follow us all of our days, and that we might be the light everywhere we go. We lift up all those that we have named, and we lift up those in our hearts as well. You know all their needs. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to say when they pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And continuing in prayer, God, we lift this up to you in prayer. Please do what we cannot do ourselves. We need you to break through into our lives, our congregation, and our community. Use us together for unimagined new purposes on behalf of Christ. Break through any barriers that stand in your way and hold us back. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Robin up to come up front. Today we're getting a ministry update on our caring ministry and our emergency fund. Finally got here. Ooh, sorry. Good morning. Um, I have been asked to um, share with you some information about two of the other ministries that we do, which is our caring ministry, which involves um, going to meet shut-ins and visiting with them and all of that kind of stuff, and then the emergency fund. First of all, the caring ministry consists of about a half a dozen people or more from this congregation who visit our shut-ins once a month and take communion if the receiver requests it. Pastor Cheryl visits these congregational members on a rotating schedule as well. This ministry helps connect those from our church who are not able to be here and is often very welcome as some do not have many visitors. If you would be interested in helping out with this ministry, please call Cheryl, um, Pastor Cheryl or myself and um, we could get you connected with someone um, some of the congregation is aging, and so we have more and more need for that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> the second one is our emergency fund ministry. This fund has, fund has been a god sighting for many in this community who are on the margins of society, including those who are completely homeless. Many times family promise is completely full, and these families have no one else to turn to. Some of the things that we can do with the generous donations that this congregation gives to us is help with utilities, a month's worth of rent, fixing a car, just to name a few. Each situation is unique. Um, each person that comes to us is allowed up to $300 a year as a gift from us for whatever their need is, and then they must wait 12 months um, before they get more help. 
Occasionally we may decide that a certain person or family needs more than this in a calendar year. Um, these instances are rare, however. We also connect folks with our clothes closet if they are in need of clothing or coats. Um, your donation to this ministry is crucial as well, and we thank you for those who have donated so far. Each family or individual that comes to us looking for help is vetted to make sure that their story is legitimate. Um, some, we just don't want to get scammed and we want the, the money to go to the right place. So we do take very good care to make sure that it's, it's something that we um, should be helping with. In addition to our help, we also have a resource sheet that we put together that lists all the resources available to those in, Wash in Hartford and in Washington County that could give them some further help besides that. This uh, list includes, but it's not limited to, um, a number for social services, United Way, City of Hartford Energy Help, local food pantries, Salvation Army, and many others. Just There's many others on the list. It's really quite a lengthy list, but not every person needing help needs all of them, but they might have a unique situation. Um, if you remember, we helped numerous people at Christmas with up to a three-night stay at the Super 8 as it was very cold. We had minus wind chills minus 37 or even more than that, and family promise was full. This bought them a little time to try and figure something else out. We so appreciate your willingness to help at this time of the year. If you would like to donate to the emergency fund at some point, please mark your donations accordingly. Um, checks should be made out to FUMC with a note in the memo indicating the emergency fund. Please note that we make every effort to make sure that your donations are spent wisely. If you need more information, please feel free to talk to me at any time about these two important ministries that you all help support. And thank you to everyone. Thank you, Robin. I get the privilege, especially when Robin's in the office, of listening to her minister to the people that call for help. Um, and that is her gift. It really is. She's wonderful with them, but she's also um, sets boundaries as well. So it's just um, such a joy to be able to witness that ministry. I would ask our ushers to come forward. until Christ returns in glory. Amen. Our closing song this morning is the Lord of the Dance, number 261, verses 1 through 3.
May God bless you with seeking. Seek out the hungry, seek the weary, seek the good in every person you pass. Seek out the hopeful, seek the faithful, seek God in each of us. And as you seek and as you wonder, may you find what you are looking for. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us, go now in peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.